Hello XJW agents and welcome back to the Darth Magog channel. I'm your host, the friendly neighborhood Dark Lord of the Apostates, Darth Magog. And today I found something interesting during the September 2022 JW broadcasting. During a discussion about media, Stephen Lett allowed a certain illustration to sneak by that showed off his less than desirable views about domestic abuse in Jehovah's Witness marriages. Allow me to explain. We would be honored if you would join us. Before we begin, I do want to make one thing clear. Jehovah's Witnesses are not all wife beaters or domestic abusers. The religion does not promote its members committing spousal abuse. In fact, JW.org has several articles decrying spousal abuse. These articles include some practical advice an abused spouse could take, and advice for those who suspect their loved ones are being abused. According to an independent review by Women's Views on News, some of the advice is actually helpful. At least, at first. Put a pin in this one, we'll review it again later in the video. I'd like to return our attention to one of Jehovah's Witnesses' governing body members, Stephen Lett, and his brief talk on adultery and divorce. So the talk starts with Stephen Lett admonishing faithful viewers to reject the worldly media as well as apostates. Pretty standard talk, that's how a lot of these JW broadcasts have gone over the last few years. What interests me is how he presents the worldly view of divorce and adultery. If I may, I'd like to present the September JW Broadcasting of 2022, timestamps of 1407 through 1507. Here, Stephen Lett describes what I can only assume is literally every Lifetime original movie ever in about a minute. And this world's media is very skillful at presenting something bad as good. For example, in a movie, a female character might be portrayed as having a husband who is abusive. You liked the woman, and you, you want her to find happiness. Then, a handsome man starts working in her office, and he's so nice to her. There's an attraction between them, and the budding romance is presented as something good. Soft background music makes it hard to consider her course to be bad. It's easy to keep watching and hope she leaves her marriage mate and runs off with her workmate. And usually that's what happens. So easily we can forget that Jehovah and Jesus hate adultery and unscriptural divorce. No, I did not move any of that audio around. You can go straight to JW.org and listen to the same talk from that timestamp. Stephen Lett went on record and called a woman wanting to leave her abusive spouse for a man she's attracted to, respected by, and loved by as bad. So I'll give Stephen Lett this. From a purely technical perspective, if this hypothetical Lifetime original character were to start a sexual relationship with the fictional Mr. Handsome while still married to Mr. Abuser, that would legally constitute adultery. Though that does bring up the question as to why Stephen Lett himself is more concerned about the theoretical soft piano music and budding romance than the theoretical battering of an innocent woman. In the same talk a moment earlier, Stephen Lett describes the Jehovah's Witness view on divorce. Let's listen in on Lett. Jesus said, You heard that it was said, You must not commit adultery. But I say to you, that everyone who keeps on looking at a woman so as to have a passion for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Our fine shepherd is telling us not only to avoid sexual immorality, but also to flee from anything that could lead to it, such as immoral thoughts. And at Matthew 19, 9, our fine shepherd tells us, I say to you that whoever divorces his wife except on the grounds of sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. Here Jesus makes clear that the only valid basis for divorce and remarriage in God's eyes is if a disloyal mate commits sexual immorality. That's a lot to unpack there, isn't it, XJW agents? In that very brief clip, Brother Stephen Lett, anointed governing body member and elder in the Christian congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses, has very plainly stated that outside of sexual immorality, 
there are no instances in which a JW couple, mixed faith or same faith, may divorce. So, if your partner stops paying the mortgage, stops cooking, stops cleaning, won't go to work, won't go to the Kingdom Hall, won't look after the children, drinks to excess, starts taking drugs, or even beats you, Jehovah and Jesus do not see this as grounds for divorce. So, why is this so important? Well, I think to fully understand that, we should fully understand how Jehovah's Witnesses feel about marriage. Marriage, according to Jehovah's Witnesses, is a divine institution set in motion by Jehovah God himself. It's designed as a permanent bond of union between a man and a woman that they might be mutually helpful to each other. The insight on the scriptures book highlights the so-called basic purpose of marriage as the reproducing of members of the human family. Note that this does not apply to same-sex marriages. According to JW.org, under Bible Questions Answered, marriages in JW culture are intended only to be heterosexual in nature. Thus, God intended marriage to be a permanent, intimate bond between a man and a woman. Men and women are designed to complement each other so they may be capable of satisfying each other's emotional and sexual needs and of providing children. So despite different governments and jurisdictions finding it perfectly lawful, Marriage only counts to Jehovah's Witnesses because only a man can satisfy a woman's emotional and sexual needs and vice versa, as well as providing children. So now that we understand why marriage is such a big deal in the JW community, we have a better understanding of why they hate divorce so much. The Insight on the Scriptures publication defines divorce as, quote, legal dissolution of the marital union, hence the severance of the marriage bond between a husband and a wife. It's interesting to note that the same publication states that apparently the Jehovah figure made no such provision for divorce when he came up with marriage. The witnesses adhere to this practice closely, refusing to divorce except only on the grounds of what they consider sexual immorality. An interesting note is that not all sexual immorality is considered grounds for divorce, and even if it qualifies, the divorce remains optional. The Remain in God's Love book delves into this further. It states that the Christian congregation doesn't always recommend a divorce, and reminds readers that the innocent mate has the choice to stay and reconcile with the adulterer. The religion allows those involved to make the final choice. What constitutes adultery varies. It was noted that in the January 1st, 1972 Watchtower, in questions from readers, that despite Jehovah's Witnesses' view on gay relationships, they wouldn't acknowledge a gay affair as grounds for divorce. I've placed the direct quote on the screen because I really struggle with saying this out loud, but the bottom line is, on their official website, Watchtower has no qualms about comparing relations with an animal to that of relations with someone of the same gender. And evidently, while the religion abhors these radically different interactions equally, Neither of them are as abhorrent as falling in love with someone who isn't your spouse, even if your spouse is abusive. Make of that what you will. The final part is adultery. Adultery is considered a serious sin in Jehovah's Witness culture and has repercussions. In addition to it being grounds for divorce, a mate that is considered unrepentant could very well be disfellowshipped. Disfellowshipping in Jehovah's Witness culture results in any believer ignoring and shunning the disfellowshipped individual. So, if a witness were to try and escape an abusive marriage through adultery, they would risk all of their contact with friends and family still in the faith. And this can only occur according to the Shepherd the Flock of God book if the evidence establishing wrongdoing is sufficient enough to warrant the formation of a judicial committee. So, if an abusive spouse were to cheat, the victim would need proof to be free to scripturally divorce and marry someone healthier for them. Because marrying someone when you're not considered scripturally free is tantamount to adultery in this religion, and once again could result in shunning. Jehovah, apparently, isn't that heartless. He does offer a provision called separation. This is an instance where a spouse would be permitted to live away from one spouse temporarily. According to the Keep Yourselves in God's Love book, in extreme situations, you can separate from your spouse. One instance would be willful non-support, meaning if a husband is not providing for his family monetarily, the family has a choice to separate from him, and the congregation elders may disfellowship him for such a sin. 
Absolute endangerment of spiritual life, meaning that a spouse is actively trying to get their believing spouse to skip meetings or sin against Jehovah. And finally, extreme physical abuse. Note the qualifiers of physical and extreme, meaning that if your literal health and life aren't in danger, then no separation. And while your local elders may investigate the abuse, this only applies to abusers that are baptized Jehovah's Witnesses. There is no mention of reaching out to law enforcement or any other outside authority, even for non-believing abusers. Not to mention, while extreme is subjective, physical is not. Meaning that if you are being emotionally or mentally abused by your spouse as a Jehovah's Witness, then it's not a good enough reason to leave even temporarily. So, how do Jehovah's Witnesses recommend getting away from an abusive spouse? Well, they don't really. Abigail probably felt the same way, but with more reason. Her husband was a bully and a drunkard and was despised by his entire household. At that time, many marriages were arranged, so Abigail had very little control over her circumstances. But her words and actions showed that she was a spiritual woman who didn't focus on what she could not control, but what she could. Instead, the goal is for the abused spouse to stick things out and use their Bible-based training to win over their abuser, and potentially make them an upstanding witness. The onus is placed back upon the victim, who is now focused on changing not their marriage or their spouse, but themselves. Remember that article from WVON that we cited earlier? Yeah, they were reviewing an article from an Awake magazine, and it's not as wholesome as it sounds. The April 2013 Awake article highlights a couple by the name of Troy and Valerie. Troy, who grew up physically abused and therefore physically abused his wife in secret, as well as Valerie, who was a faithful Jehovah's Witness. And while the article highlights legitimate concerns of abuse getting worse with reporting, it also paints the solution being Jehovah's Witnesses. Because the kindness that Valerie's study conductor showed after Troy had hospitalized his own son convinced him to study and just put away his abusive nature. Simple as that. What it boils down to is telling abuse spouses that with a few Bible studies, their abuse partners can change. Despite experts in the field, like Sandra Horley of Refuge, stating the exact opposite. The December 2018 Watchtower actually admonishes victims of domestic abuse against filing for divorce against their abuser. In paragraph 15 of the article titled, Honor What God Has Yoked Together, the Watchtower has this to say. Paul advised that whatever the underlying problems, if sexual immorality is not involved, the goal should be reconciliation. It follows up by referencing unnamed other Christians who have been in comparably difficult situations to an abusive relationship that chose to stay and make it work. Which, while that is admittedly an individual choice, to advise that in a periodical distributed to millions worldwide is less than cautious when it comes to the dangers of domestic abuse. Returning to the 2013 Awake article, I found it interesting that while the Awake magazine does reference a survey regarding the frequency of domestic violence hotline calls, it fails to provide any external resources for victims. Victims that they recognize could be male or female, as they found that male victims tend to under-report. The follow-up article on JW.org outlines some practical advice for victims of such abuse, including reaching out to a medical professional or using hotlines to gather resources. It also reminds them that their abuser is at fault for the abuse, not the victim. But again, it doesn't offer any direct contacts. A final interesting note is that the gray box, How You Can Help a Victim, includes a bizarre footnote. The footnote reads, If you are concerned about a victim of the opposite sex, it is best to limit the help you personally provide and encourage her to seek help from a trusted female friend which, in a situation like that, can't possibly be practical. This reinforces the cultural JW perspective that a man and a woman can't possibly spend any time together alone for any reason without it certainly resulting in adultery. 
So when you factor in a culture that places marriage on a divine pedestal, a searing hatred for divorce, hyper-specific gender rules, and rigid standards of interaction between the sexes, you get a Jehovah's Witness culture of abuse. So yes, the Jehovah's Witnesses and their parent organization, the Watchtower, do not promote spousal abuse. But when the leadership publishes not to leave your abusive spouse in black and white and then speaks those words from the platform, that's enough to prove that they are not bothered by the concept at all. So that's condoning spousal abuse in my book.